Uh, we are continuing on in our study of the book of Acts. Welcome if you've joined us this evening. We're in Acts and uh, we are slowly making our way through this book. Our goal is to have it done before the Lord returns, which hopefully is soon. So we better get a move on. All right, we are, we're in Acts chapter 1, and we're, uh, we're going to look at uh, verse 12 to 26 this morning, um, but I'm going to read from uh, verse, verse 6, just to give us some good context, and then, we, uh, yeah, then we're going to crack on in. It says this, so when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from, uh, from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In these days... Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in about 120, and he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke uh, beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. Nice. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that that field was called uh, uh, in their own language, uh, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate. And let there be no one to dwell in it. And let another take his office. So some uh, of the men who have... So, sorry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in, his, in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray. Father, your word is good, and it is so exciting to open this word and to reflect upon your goodness and to see your triumphant hand moving in these early days of the church. Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts to find great confidence in you. Would you cause us to find great Um, love? Would you cause us to be people who would take this call to be witnesses to your resurrection? Seriously, I pray, Lord. And so, Lord God, we submit this time. Would you grab our attentions, Lord? Would you uh, lead us into this text to love you more and um, to steward this life that you've given us for your glory, we pray. Amen. 
So last week we asked the question, how did we get here? How did we get here? Well, this morning we're going to answer the question, so what do we do now? Which in context, like in many different contexts, you know, like what do we do now is, you know, wherever you put the emphasis, or as my dad likes to say, wherever you put the emphasis, you know, it depends on how that kind of thing goes, right? Like, so what do we do now? It could be more along lines, oh, so what do we do now? Or it could be like, so what do we do now? What are we supposed to do? So Jesus has conquered death. He's appeared to them multiple times. And in fact, in what we read this morning, we see that Jesus is, he commands them, he gives them their commands, he gives them a promise. And then from there, he is just like, like ascends into heaven. It says like a cloud came and just lifted him up and just took him away. And they're all just standing there. And I love the humanity of Acts. In fact, throughout the Bible, I just love the humanity of the Bible because they're all staring there, seeing one of the most insane things in their life go on. And then these two other men come along and they're like, why are you staring into heaven? They're like, did you not just see what just happened? Like, was we the only people that kind of saw that thing go on? And these uh, messengers relay to them saying, just so you're aware, the way that he went is the way he's coming back. And it's not necessarily to say, like, uh, geographically, this is, this is where he's going to end up, right? It's not necessarily trying to answer that question. It's more along the same lines as going, he's going to return. The, the one who has conquered death and so therefore exalted above every other name, the one who is the king above all kings, proven, the conqueror of death, he's going to return. And so you better do something about it. And so we actually see, right, from the, the very beginning of Acts, that, that God is establishing uh, uh, some very important things for us to understand about the church, right? We see the church in, as its infancy, in, the, in it, it's almost like a seed, which we now reap the benefit of, which is amazing. And we see that um, in his setting up of this church, is establishing this church that first and foremost, that God is seen to be the, the sovereign one who rules over this church. Like he lays it out. He commands them. He tells them what's supposed to happen. He is the ruler. He is the king. He is the head of this church. And that though he is ascended, uh, and he, as the head, his body is the one that is still functioning and still present here in this world. But also we see that, that there is a love for this church in the way that he's setting it up, in the way that he's talking to his disciples. He doesn't just save these guys and just kind of just says, okay, now go. I'm going to send you out to the wolves and just kind of just hope for the best for you. But no, he, he takes these, these soon-to-be witnesses of his resurrection and he trains them. And it says for 40 days he's there and he's preparing them. That is, that is a, a God who has a deep love for this church that is going to flourish and grow because of the witness of these people. And we see this, this, this love of this sovereign God for these, these people. We also notice, right, that... In this sovereign love that God has established for his people, he, he blesses them and he gives them many things. And it's worth us just kind of just pausing and having a look at this sentence because it becomes way more important when we start to get into Pentecost and the Holy Spirit that kind of follows on from here. Because he promises them um, in verse 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, what we read today has sometimes been poorly translated by people or interpreted by people to, to talk about that um, this blessing of the Holy Spirit, this gift of the Holy Spirit, came because, well, one, God promised it, but then also, two, the, because of the prayer of these witnesses. But, it's, but, but what you need to understand is, is the language of Scripture is very much that the Holy Spirit being gifted to the church is a passive thing for the church. And so like in the Greek, 
the, the verb used here that's spoken about, is, it's put in a passive tense. It's essentially like saying, and he was clothed. As if I were to put a jacket on you. It's like it's been given to you as a gift. Not on your merit, not on how pious or how hard you've worked, not on how good or your prayer life or anything of the sort, the Holy Spirit that was about to be given to them in power was one that was completely a gift. Completely a gift. No merit of the church that was to happen. And so it's really important for us to understand that. And the reason why the Bible wants us to remember this is because this book goes out to the church. And so what we like to do is we like to bottle everything. Like we, we, what we like to do is to pour everything into a formula. And so we look at this text and go, oh, they were of one accord and they were praying. And that's how the Holy Spirit moves in the church today. But that's not, that's not the testimony of Scripture. Testimony of Scripture is one that God is the sovereign ruler of his church and he pours out with generous grace upon his people just because. Because he's a loving God and because he's about his mission and because he promised it. And so this text opens up emphatically of wanting us to understand that before we go any further, we need to understand that the God of, the, of this church, the God of the, the, the Bible is the one who is the most sovereign. He is the ruler of everyone and everything. And he, he rules over this church. Uh, this is also on display as we see the ascension of Christ. Um, it's not, all this has not just been spoken about just for a great story <laughs> or just to say why Jesus is not physically present any longer with the disciples. It's not just kind of go, just so you're wondering, he ascended. But the idea of the ascension was actually um, exemplifying the truth about who Jesus was. That he's not just the um, meek looking shepherd guy that we see in really bad photos around the place or paintings, you know, like the, the Italian Jesus who's got the sheep everywhere and there's generally like a rainbow behind him and he's got rosy cheeks and he's got a staff that, and you're just thinking, I don't want to follow that guy. That's not the, that's not the Jesus we serve. The ascension uh, makes it really clear that the Jesus that we serve, the Jesus that is declared in the Scripture, is the one who sits on a throne, who is high and lifted up. That there are, there are beings in heaven who sing 24-7, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They sing that about Jesus. He is the, the conquering king. He's not that little meek shepherd boy. And so if there was a question of his sovereignty before his death, uh, before his life, uh, before this resurrection, we now see that through the resurrection and, and also through the ascension, it cements his spot as the king above all kings. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 20 to 23, it says this, um, that he, he worked in Christ, this is the father, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Acts kicks off heavily wanting us to understand that when Christ descends, he doesn't just leave this church here to kind of just go like, and you're just going to figure it out. Good luck. He's, he's not like a, 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 you know, like a, a mum and dad have gone to work and they've kind of locked the door from the outside and as they've walked out, they're kind of like, don't kill each other. We love you. Goodbye. That's not how it works. That's not what, that, what, it, what is... Uh, clearly shown here in this text is that he, Christ is ascending and he's going to send the Spirit as a gift 
and that that then through the work of the Spirit, they will be witnesses out into the world. And he sits on the throne high and lifted up. So what we see in this text, right, uh, that, that, that follows on from there. So from verse 12 onwards, we see what the church, uh, how, how do they respond to that? And, and really, it, it answers a question for us in, in many different ways. But first of all, it answers this question for us in, in going, how do we, as the people who have been saved by God, how are we now supposed to respond to this ascended king? Like, what are we supposed to do? How do we respond in it? And, and so we're going we're gonna to have a look at that and see how the church responds to, to this uh, ascended king as his people, loved by him. But also we're, we'll actually get to see in amongst all of that how it is that we live and obey the will of God because he is the king. How do we live and obey that within, in our everyday life? So first and foremost, what's what's the first thing that we see? Well, we see that on the church obeys straight away. The church obeys. God, uh, Jesus commands them to stay and wait. He says, "Stay and wait." Uh, and so we see that the the ascension takes place in the Mount of Olives, the very place that Jesus is arrested. And so very quickly they they return to the place where they were staying nearby. And the Bible gives us this information. It says um, it's a Sabbath day journey, which is like, it's like saying it was like a stone's throw away. It was like really close uh, to the Mount of Olives. Um, but just for all of you who are playing along at home, um, the Sabbath day journey, it had to be within 2,000 cubits, which you all know what a cubit is. So that's really helpful. Um, it's about 1.2 Ks. So on a Sabbath day, According to the Jewish rules, because it wasn't in the law, like there's nowhere that says in the law that you, you could do something like that, but they established these kind of fences, these rules and stuff around the law, and they said um, you can't walk more than 1.2 Ks on the Sabbath. Fun fact. So then what happens next is we get to see a description of what the church does between the, the ascension of Jesus and then uh, next week, Pentecost, which is the, the, the falling of the Holy Spirit upon them. So they've got 10 days. There's 50 days between Pentecost, um, between um, the uh, resurrection of Jesus and Pentecost. There's 50 days between there. And the Bible says that Jesus was present with them for 40. And so 10 days, um, the, the church is waiting and seeing. And so what happens in verse 13 and 14? It names that the apostles are all there. Um, and then it follows on from that and it says that they were with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with uh, the women, or that could be translated to together with their wives, um, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And uh, this, this, this sentence comes up quite often in Scripture. They were like of one accord and prayer. It actually, uh, this, this whole idea of them coming and praying together happens every time before something significant happens in the church, which would show us the value of prayer in the church, the value of gathered prayer in the church. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that uh, in a minute. So it says all of them, every single one of them, uh, every man, woman, child, apostle, the, their wives, um, Jesus' family. Like, think about that for a second. It, it, it goes to um, great lengths to point out to us that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers are there. It would take a lot for your siblings to say that you're the Messiah. Right? It would take a lot. I mean, I think I'm a pretty good brother, but... There's no way that I would ever be able to convince my brothers that I am the Messiah. I've tried. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So that like the testimony that, that Jesus' family, who at first, if you look in the gospel accounts, fully rejected him. Like they're like, he's crazy. They like they came to collect him at times. They rejected him. But the but they saw what happened. They saw the resurrection. They, they saw 
and now they've seen his ascension. And so his family, it says that his family were then there um, committing themselves to prayer. And so we see that in, in obedience to God and obedience to Christ being the king, the, the first way that we see that the church being obedient to that is um, by prayer. And that might seem like a really simple idea, but the truth is in Scripture, like prayer is an essential part of the church. And even further than that, congregational prayer, like the saints gathering together to pray and pray regularly was essential for the, for the early church. They would do it often. In fact, the, the language that's used here is they're like, every day they were just getting, getting together to pray. Um, and when they prayed, it was generally together. Now, I, I, I honestly think that uh, this is a really good challenge for us as, as church, as a church in general, the church is modern Western church, because one of the ways that I think that um, I, I've seen that this culture, and, and particularly our culture, this cultural moment has really like seeped into the church and robbed the church in many ways, is this idea of an individual faith. You know, like, I've had tons of friends that I'm like, they're like, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, but I've got no time for the church. Right? Like, we've, most of us have probably thought that for ourselves at some point in time, or uh, no friends who are, you know, either just worshipping at home or, or something along those lines. The problem is, is that testimony of Scripture is, is one that heavily, heavily is about the church gathering together. Now, don't get me wrong. Your individual faith is super important. You cannot rest on the faith of someone else next to you. Like when you stand before God and the testimony and the witness of your life, it's not like you're going to be like, yeah, but Luke says I'm a pretty good guy. Like it just, that just doesn't work that way, right? So your, your faith is definitely individual. You have to take your own ownership of that, right? But... The truth is that your faith is not made to be lived out by itself. You were designed to be a part of a body, like a little chopped off finger trying to go out and do its job as a, as a part of a hand. It doesn't work. <laughs> so this is the image of like a little finger trying to, you know, trying to pick up things. It doesn't work. Or like coal that's been in a fire and has fallen out of the fire. What happens to the coal when it's away from the, the congregation of coals? It's cold, right? We've been, we've been designed to, to, to be a part of a body. All the language of the church throughout Scripture is a language of togetherness. We're being a, a building that has been brought together. We're a body. I think one of the gifts of... of um, of COVID, that whole COVID debacle, was that it showed us that um, that isolation is not good. And I would just want to encourage you all, um, as 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 believers, as 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 followers of Christ, to to not necessarily look at this text and see it as if like, oh, this is what I must do because the early church did this, I must do this. No, we got the great blessing to look on, and and see the. The, the rhythms of this church and, and be encouraged by this and go, well, actually, we need to be a people that are, that are for one another's. We're, we're, we're a people that, that pray and rely on God in prayer, but together as his people. Um, it then goes on and it talks about that they had the same mind, that they were in unity. They were unifying around Jesus and his call to witness. And so, so they prayed. Like, imagine that. Like, here's this church. They've seen Jesus go and be ascended. And, and he's told them, like, wait. Like, don't do anything until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, like, I don't know about you, but I'll be thinking, what does that look like? How, what is it going to look like when the Holy Spirit... And so they're just waiting. And so like, you know, something happens. Like, is that the Holy Spirit? Like, is that... 
Did he say that? That's what he's going to trust. And Jesus would be like, trust me, you'll know. You'll know when this, this thing is going to happen. But the excitement would be just so tangible of going on in the place. They'd be chomping at the bit to go and tell everybody about what the heck they've just experienced. Yet what they do is they pour their energy into prayer. They understood their position. Are people who need to submit under the king who is Jesus, who will take them and tell them exactly where they need to go. Are people who fully relied on God in prayer. And, and what a great picture we get to see that. Uh, Luke, in, uh, in, in the book of Luke, in ch- uh, verse, sorry, chapter 24, gives us a description of what that, that prayer and that time looked for and looked like. In verse 50, it says, um, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And this is the story of Jesus ascending in the book of Luke. And while he blessed him, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Verse 52 sums up this whole section that we're reading. It says, And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. You know, the seeing the work of what Christ has done, living in his grace, drives us to prayer. And I, like, I just think this is a really good thing kind of spot for us to pause. Often what we really like to do is, as I said, we like to bottle things, right? We like to try and work out an equation for as to why we should do something or how to get a better this or how to have a greater prayer life. Like, you know, if I just get these simple, easy steps, I'll be able to pray more and more. I actually think the witness of Scripture is just that prayer comes from a place of living in the grace of God. And the reason why it's worthy of pausing here is, is, is I, I, like if you were to assess your life and look at the, you know, the, the, how prayerful you are, like how often are you going before God and asking Him of and, and relying on him. And as, you know, the testimony of this scripture says, like, with great joy. The answer of this is like, oh, I've just got to try and pray more. That's not the answer. The answer is actually to go and, and see the grace of God. Go and witness the goodness of what he's done. Like, don't think that you're like, oh, I, I need to try and make this thing happen now. No, no, their response to seeing what Jesus had done in, in their life and their response to seeing what Jesus had done and, and witnessing that, their, their response was like, it was prayer. It was just it naturally led them to prayer. And so your prayer life comes out of your joy-filled devotion to God. It comes from your like resting in Him and, and finding confidence in Him and spending time with Him in His Word. I guarantee you, if you spend more time with Him in your Word, your, your prayer life will come to life. And so I say that to you to go, like, how's your heart this morning around that? Like, is your prayerlessness just revealing how little you are relying on Him? Like, how little you are spending time with Him? How, how little you are reflecting on His good nature? Like, is your, is your prayerlessness just a, um, a, a picture into kind of the, the, the dryness of, of where you might be at in that? My, like, I, I encourage you this evening to... To res- like respond to that. If you are, f- if you're feeling that way, do something about it. That's actually what repentance is. Often we think of repentance as like fire and brimstone, you know, like responding so then you don't get thrown into the, the, the um, gates of hell. But repentance is just like returning. It's just returning and looking upon God. Seeing for who he truly is. And respond. You know, often I find another really good way to grow in your prayer life is actually just to be with the congregation, be with people. You suck at praying, find people to pray with. Let their love for God and their love for you stir your heart to want to pray more. 
Because there's nothing that brings uh, us to one mind for the mission of God than prayer with the saints. And so you can do it this Thursday night, uh, Gospel Life. <laughs> and so their, their, um, their first response to the sovereignty of God, to the one who is revealed to be in control of his church, is unified prayer. Now it says, it goes on from there. It says, during those times, Peter stood up among his brothers. The company of um, persons was in all about 120. And he, he goes on and he, um, he, he exegetes scripture to them, right? And so uh, Peter gets up and he preaches and there's, it says there's 120 people there. And he outlines to them and applies scripture to them. It's clear that Peter has learned from Jesus and, uh, and learned to apply all of Scripture to the gospel. Because interesting, right, that he is talking about stuff that happened in his time by referring all the way back to the Psalms. So he quotes uh, Psalm 69 verse 25 and Psalm 109 verse 8. And, and so what Peter does is he, he outlines that the Holy Spirit spoke through David to write these two psalms. And, um, and what he then does is he goes and he applies this to what's happening here in this scripture. Because what Peter had learned is, and then what Jesus was teaching them um, when he was with them in those 40 days, and we see that because at the end of Luke, he goes and he walks with those disciples on the road to Emmaus and he points out to them and says, all the scriptures pointing to Jesus. And he explains that to him. And so we can see that Peter, has, has, he's actually a, a, applied that skill to here. And he said that all the way back when, when David was talking about what David was talking about, he was actually referring uh, in part to this moment. That there would be one whose, whose camp deserves to be desolate and, and, and there will be um, no one to dwell in it. As in there is one who is going to be accursed because of what he does to Jesus. He then also then applies the psalm that uh, follows that in Psalm 109 and, and, and says that we need to find another to, to take his office. Um, and, and the reason why he can do that is because he says, um, uh, in verse 16, he says, Brothers, this, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. This is one of the great testimonies of how Scripture works, is that the Scripture is wholly written by man and, and wholly written by God. That, that God, by the Holy Spirit, speaks through the writer. And so... Um, while David might have a, a, a purpose to writing that, and if you go and read those Psalms, which I would encourage you to go and read those Psalms, we see that in those Psalms, David's talking about people who betray him, these, his enemies of his. And so David clearly had an intent. But yet, the Holy Spirit had a purpose in that to foreshadow what would happen in Christ. That there is a, there is a gospel arc to all of Scripture. And so what, um, what Peter points out to them all is he, he's helping them to understand. He's saying that, yes, though, though David was saying those things about what was present contextually in his day, the truth is that the Holy Spirit had another intent and another purpose of what's going on, and that was to point towards Christ. And so we now need to be obedient to that text. But isn't that exactly how God works in our day and age now? Like, let's, let's talk about the sovereignty of God for a moment here. I know we spent plenty of time in Genesis reflecting on this, but this is a wonderful picture of how God sovereignly works in our lives today. We work with our wills and our intent to do stuff, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, whatever it might be. But yet God is sovereignly working all things to his purposes, and it's this beautiful balance 
So you could ask me, okay, if God is sovereign, and I believe that God is wholly sovereign, sovereign over salvation, this, like the testimony of Scripture is that God is sovereign over everything. And so if you were to ask me today, okay, but if God is sovereign over everything, how is it that I have a free will? And I would say, yes. <laughs> because at the same time as my will is working freely within the plans and purposes of God's good work, God is working everything to his purposes, which are good and beautiful and majestic. And at the end of everything, I'm going to look back and go, wow, that was beautiful. And, and if we would look back in the moments in our lives, we would see the witness of that God's sovereign hand. I was certain that when I blew my shoulders out for swimming, I don't know if you're aware I used to be a swimmer, I thought it was the end of the world. I thought there was nothing good about me any longer. I'd put all of my eggs in that basket, and I thought that that's all I had. Now that I look back on it, I go, thank you, Jesus, that your plans and purposes absolutely ruled and reigned over mine. And that you moved all things to your will. And in the same way as that we see that with David and his, his plans and, and as he's writing these things out, that God sovereignly had another will and another purpose that was working all things to the glory of Christ. And so Peter responds to that by then living in obedience to that, saying, okay, well, we now need to do something about this. We actually have to replace this guy because... Uh, because of this, this command that God has given to us. And so they, um, because, uh, so, so they, they, um, they put a plan in place to, to bring in this next, next apostle. Before it, it gets to that point, the, the, the Bible does something really interesting because it kind of pauses and talks about that kind of icky moment where his bowels were cut open and he fell headlong and he burst in the middle and, and everything gushed out, which is wonderful um, language for a Sunday evening. But it's, this is actually really important for what goes on next for when they're choosing their apostles. Because one, it lays out very clearly that the Bible knew that Judas was going to betray Jesus. So we see that. But... It also says in there that Judas chose to go his own way. God's sovereignty, man's will. God knew it so much so that the, the Psalms, well before Judas ever existed, spoke about this man who would betray Jesus. Really, like the most God forsaken man in Scripture was, was, was prophesied about. And for the disciples, that would have been really hard. Because could you imagine that, right? There they are with this man who they spent three years traveling all around Judea, Samaria. They've they traveled everywhere. And then if they find out that this dude is the one who betrays them. Like he looked after their money. Like they would have, they would have lain next to him on the, in the wilderness together. They would have shared and witness things like they would have seen Jesus heal people and, and like they would have caused great emotional responses to that. Like, what is going on? They would have cried together, they would have laughed together, like they would have been the boys together, you know, the bros. Like they would have, you know what I mean? Like they would have there would have been such great intimacy. And then all of a sudden, there's this Judas guy turning up with a horde who are holding bludgeons and fire and weapons and arresting the guy that they've been following for years in the secret of the night. That would have been unsettling for them. And, and all the people who would have like looked at the disciples and followed the disciples and, and all that going on would be like, are these guys legitimate now? And so what Peter does is he, he roots this in Scripture by going, no, no, don't worry. Christ is so, still sovereign. This was all a part of this good plan. But then what he also does is he reveals that what actually that whole process was, was, was God revealing the heart of Judas. But by speaking of the fact that... Um, uh, that he, he, yes, he was numbered among us and he, he was allotted to share in our ministry. And then by uh, right at the end where it speaks of the fact that, um, you know, that uh, we need to now find someone who will come and join in our ministry and our apostleship. 
which Judas turned aside to go in his own place. And then what follows directly after that then is they, they name these two people that they think are going to be right for the position and then they ask the Lord to do exactly what he had just done with Judas, as in reveal their hearts. We can't do that. Clearly we thought Judas was our mate, right? Like we look on him and we go, this guy's good. He's legitimate. No worries. Everything about him seems right. He seems to even have the right fruit. Good guy. And then all of a sudden he's not. And the, the world's kind of shattered. And so what do they do about that? Well, they give it back to God. They say, okay, well, we need someone to step in and replace him. And so God, we ask that you would expose this man's heart. We don't know. He seems good. He fits all the qualifications to be an apostle. But we need to check this person's heart. Because the truth is that God is sovereign over his church. And his mission, which he's been working through all human history and was planned before human history began, God is working all things to those purposes. And so he loves this church. He loves the church, the body of Christ across all generations, denominations. He loves this body. And he will he will expose the hearts of those who are present within it. Just as he exposed what's going on in Judas's heart, he too will expose what is going on in the hearts of his people today. Church, like, that weighs heavy on me. Like, outside of of what Christ has done in, in, in our hearts, we're, we're wretched. And there is no way that we deserve to be a part of the body of Christ. But by, by his grace and by his love, we are brought into that thing. And he values this church. He values his people so much. But it weighs heavy on me because what I want is that, that my heart when exposed before the Lord that it is for him and not for my own purposes. Because ultimately in the end, like the sin of Judas is just unbelief. You can go through your whole life in church, grow up in a Christian family, do all the right things, give every week, serve on a team, sing, whatever, you can be one of those people who gives money to the poor. You can be that person that everyone's like, be like that guy. Be like that girl. They're involved. How amazing are they? But the truth is before God, where you're truly honest, that's where your heart is exposed. And, and you can fool us. Like We can fool one another as best we can. I guess the, 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 the test and the challenge of it all is it's like if you would like to add anything to Jesus, if you would like to add anything to Christianity, if you'd like to try and make that thing fit around you and your own agenda, it's, it, you're like selling him for 30 pieces of gold or silver. That's a challenge. And ultimately, Judas did not Believe and so therefore God exposed it, and in exposing it, He used it for His glory. I mean, Judas would have thought his intentions were good, it would have seemed like it was the right thing to do, but ultimately, his heart was for himself and in the end for his money. But as this text points out, that all it bought for him was a plot to die on. And you might be here this morning. This, uh, this evening, late afternoon, and you might be sitting there and thinking, yes, but what do I get out of it? Or I don't like Christianity because I want to add this, 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 and this. And ultimately, in the end, you are making Christianity just into a plot that you can die on. Jesus is the king of the church. He's the one who sets the doctrine. He's the one who's ultimately the ruler of that. And we submit and obey. So 
So we see that God, God submits, and I'm, I'm going to bring this thing home in the next 45 minutes or so. <laughs> I was saying to Pete earlier, it's really comfortable in here, so we might as well, like, let's maximize our time. Do, should we keep going? Like, I said, yes, your hands, everyone, okay, good, 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 we'll keep this thing going. No, no. <laughs> we'll have to be home by midnight. Man's response, right, is thing of a submission is that God exposes, and so they, they submit this thing. What happens next is really interesting. Uh, they knew, the disciples knew that it was Jesus' job to then call the disciples, as he'd done over and over and over again. So what are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to now, knowing that Jesus is the king above all kings, and he's the one who's ruling over this church and moving it to his purposes, how are the disciples supposed to live and understand the will of God in this? They know that it's his job to call these disciples. They know that they need to submit it to him. They know that he's the only one who can ex expose that. They know he's sovereign. How then are they supposed to respond to this? Now, I actually think this is really helpful for you and I. Because in this room, I'm sure that most of us understand that we need to submit under God's will. And we know that in Scripture, there's testimonies of what we're supposed to do. And we know that there's lots of good things that God calls us to do. Like take, for example, marriage. Some of you here, you're single. And you'll be going, I want to one day get married. And I know that the Bible says it's a good thing to get married. And I know that we're supposed to be wise about who we are to marry. That we're not supposed to be unequally yoked, which means, you know, Christian, you should marry a Christian, someone who has the same worldview as you. That just makes sense. If someone's dead in their sins, you don't want to be yoked to someone who's dead in their sins. These to your destruction, right? Like there's, there's lots of things that the Bible lays out for us. But how are you supposed to choose who to marry? What am I supposed to do when I meet someone who seems pretty good? How do I know if they're the right person for me? Now, in this text, it's, it's not necessarily wanting to answer this, but we actually get a good description of how they respond to this. And so, therefore, some good indicators of how we can actually, in our lives, make decisions based upon the will of God. The first thing that we see they do, right, in this, is they applied Scripture to their situation. Not flippantly, right? Not trying to just, like, loosely tie something to their situation, you know? But what they do is they, they see the Scripture in context to God's mission, as in when Peter says it was written by David, but by the Holy Spirit speaking through David, they, they apply it with that lens. So they knew that there was 12 that was needed because it displayed the reunification of Israel and, and, and they were then to be the witnesses to the 12 tribes of Israel. It was, it was essential and important. And so therefore what they did is they applied Scripture to that thing. Uh, like in the same way as if you're like, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to get married? What's that supposed to look like? You go and apply Scripture to it. You go, well, what's God looking for? Why has God designed marriage? Is it for my purposes or is it ultimately for him? Establish theologically what he wants us to do. Same thing can be said about parenting. What's my role as a parent? Do I own these kids or do these children belong to God? What's my role as a mother? What's my role as a father? What's my role as a man? What's my role as a woman? How are we as the church supposed to be? What are we supposed to do about this? It's taking the word of God in context and, and, and submitting to that first and foremost. So that requires work. It requires us to know God's word. It requires us to have good practices by applying God's word to our lives. Because let's be honest, we can make the Bible say whatever the heck we want. And we can be like, should I marry this girl? And just flip through until we find a verse that says yes. And then we're like, excellent. Should I buy this car, Lord? Yes. The Lord said he will bless you. Okay, great. Bless me with the Lamborghinis, Lord. Like we can, we can take scripture and we can mutilate it to try and make it fit to our purposes. But reading it within context, and this is what they did. They understood what they were supposed to do, right? Second. They set truthful biblical parameters. They set truthful biblical parameters. So the apostles are to be witnesses of Jesus' ministry. 
his resurrection, and then they were supposed to be chosen by Jesus. And so they talk about that. From the beginning, he says, so we need to choose one of these men who have uh, accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. And so they're like, just in case you're wondering, what was that time? From the beginning of the baptism of John uh, until, you know, that moment ago where he was taken up into heaven. Until then, we need to choose somebody. If they want to be an apostle, they have to be. They have to have seen Jesus from the beginning and been with us throughout. It can't have just been some random bloke that just turns in and says, yeah, I'll do it. No worries, mate. Jesus, yeah, yeah, I saw him. He owns that fisheries place around the corner. No, they needed to be able to... um, because they were to be witnesses to the resurrection. You can't be witnesses of the resurrection if they haven't seen the resurrected Jesus, right? Uh, As we will see, we have to answer that question when we get to Paul, because Paul wasn't around when Jesus... But in a short version of it is, is that Paul, when he saw the resurrected Jesus, so he saw number three on that list, he was then commanded to go to Jerusalem to be approved by these men. So if only three... If they could only do three, as in to see the resurrected Jesus, they then had to be approved by those who met parameters one and two. So just so you know, there are no apostles today. If someone says to you, hello, my name is Apostle, run. Any questions about that? It's pretty clear. It's just, you know, there's a lot of that going on. So what they did is they said truthful biblical parameters of what that thing's supposed to look like. They apply the theology that they did in step one. Step two, you set those biblical parameters. Step three, they seek to steward things right. They seek to steward things right. So they set those parameters and it's all based on truth where they're like, they've got to be able to have seen it. They then, what they do is they go and look amongst their accompanying people and go, who fit those parameters? And they do their homework. They go and, um, uh, it doesn't say how much time took place between them, but they go and they look at the life of Justice, who I love because it, it probably wasn't Aussie because he has three names. So he's got like all these different nicknames. You've got Justice, who was actually Joseph, but everyone just calls him Nick. You know, like it's... <laughs> That's just Aussie to the nth degree. They then, um, so they, they, they go and do their work. They do their research. They, they look into it. They spend the time to see whether steps one and two apply to these people. Uh, let's be honest. Often what we like to do when something happens and we're like, I need to know whether this is the right thing to do, we just jump all the way to prayer and we wait for a feeling. That feels pretty good. I feel peaceful about this. You know what? Often a lot of the decisions we have to make don't make us feel peaceful. Like, do I now in my workplace, because they're pushing these agendas and these ideas, should I stand up and say something at a staff meeting? It's not going to feel peaceful about that. Should I go and confront that, that friend of mine who is in sin? See, we have to steward things rightly. So firstly, they applied scripture to their situation. Secondly, they set truthful biblical parameters. Thirdly, they they stewarded things right. They did what they needed to do at the right time. And then fourthly, they submitted to God. So they take these two guys and they prayed and they said to the Lord a beautiful prayer. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. They submit it to the sovereign God. So they do the work, they apply the theology, they they think it through, but then ultimately they come before the king of, of kings and lay it at his feet. Man, this is the guy we want. I'm really bummed if it isn't, but Lord, we lay that at your feet. God, this is what I want to do. I want to go for this job, but I just lay it at your feet. I want to make this call. I want to, I want to do this. I, but we come knowing that Jesus is the king above all kings, and it requires us to come and submit it before him. So they asked Jesus to do what he did again and expose that truth. 
They do what they can, but they allow God to do what he does. And so in this way, they cast lots. And that was like an old ancient practice where they would have um, like rocks and they would be numbered and they would put it in a... Um, this is one of the ways they're doing This is the, the general Jewish way they would do it. Is they would, and they'd have a cup and whichever one came out first, they fully believed that that was the one that God directed. And this was based on um, Scripture and in, in, in Proverbs. Um, it says uh, in Proverbs... 16 verse 33, it says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And so they, they, they knew that they couldn't make that decision. It couldn't be a church vote on something like that. And so they went and they just submitted it to him and they said, God, do what you need to do in this. And so God directed the lot and he directed what was going on. And then their response to that was like, okay, well, Smith, you do, what I, you do what you need to do. And Matthias was named among the apostles and numbered among them, no worries. No worries. And for them, they saw that God was doing this. Now, we as, uh, you know, you can look at that and go, okay, so do I need, now need to go and buy some lots? Like, is this what and my response should be in this? Like, am I supposed to just draw straws every time we're supposed to do something? Well, actually, what we see from the, what happens in Acts from then on out, every decision that was made was the Holy Spirit directed them from that. And church, we as a people now, our lives are directed by the Holy Spirit. We don't need to cast lots to find out the will of God. So we can do all of these steps, but then ultimately as we submit it to God, we step out in faith trusting that the Holy Spirit is actually leading our lives. But you know what that requires of us? to know the Lord for ourselves. Like if I'm honest, most of the time when we're like, oh, I, I want to know what the Lord's will for my life is, we're asking that and we're just like spending, we don't know who he is most of the time. We're not spending any time with him, but we just want him to just be like a fortune cookie that we just open every now and then and direct our life in the right direction. But it just doesn't work that way. Like, it's, it's like you asking me, going, well, what do you think um, Donald Trump thinks about this church? I don't know the guy. Like, I could guess. I don't know what his guess would be. And I don't care. But the thing is, is it's like you're trying to expect to find the will of God to someone that you just don't know for yourself. So the, the, the reminder and the call of this text it's a call for a church that is in, is in submission to the will of God, working within that beautiful will, knowing that he rules and he reigns and we just trust and, and, and work within that. And perhaps if those who are um, preparing communion can, can do that for me. I wonder how you stand or where you stand on that this evening. Would you say that if you're trying to figure out your life and you know that generally you want the will of God in your life because it might be good or might be, you know, like you want him to bless it so that it might succeed? Or are you living a life that is in submission to the way that God has designed it for it to be? Are you someone who is laying it all down trusting that his Holy Spirit is, is leading you to where he wants you to go because you know that he matters the most and that his will trumps above your will and he is worthy of worship in your life. You know, as we take communion this evening together, reflecting on the victorious work of Christ, you know, there's so much to what communion is but reflecting on the fact that as we take this cup and as we take this bread, it is a, a reflection and a, a reminder of what Christ has done for us. Not just in, you know, just dying and, gee, that was a really good thing that he did for us, but then as a reminder that he is the king and the ruler of everyone and everything. And as we take that, we, we, we again as his church submit ourselves to him 
Perhaps you're wrestling through something, uh, a big life decision. Maybe you're, you're wrestling through that hopefully God's going to come through on this or you know, you're, you're trying to figure out what the next thing in your life. You know, let's take this moment and, and take the opportunity as this, this text encourages us as his church this evening to rest in him, as in to submit to him, to allow him to be the Lord of our lives. Do it rightly so. Let me pray and let's take communion together. Lord, we're grateful for your word and we're grateful that as we look on at this early church, we can see your sovereignty over it. We can see that even from the very beginning, you are ruling and reigning, that you're taking that thing and you're the one who's growing it. You're the one who's doing that good work. You're the one who's growing it. And Lord, we are grateful that it is in your hands. Lord, I pray that um, from this text this morning, Lord, that you would cause our, our hearts to respond uh, rightly to you. Would we submit to you, Lord? Would you help us, Lord God, to um, submit our lives to this sovereignty this sovereign king, would you help us, Lord God, to, to look to and to trust in you, I pray, Lord. Bless these people. Bless this communion as we take it. And be glorified, we pray. Amen. Amen.